Welcome to the Rugby Bits podcast, and we're here to review the final weekend of the of the United Rugby Championship. We've now set out the top eight and the and who's going to be in the playoffs. So we're going to review that, and we're going to preview the Champions Cup and Challenge Cup semifinals happening this weekend. I am Tala. I am joined today by Jared and Sean. Sean is back from the bush. He's um, he was he was an adult. He was in the Otaniqua um, uh, forest as well. So Sean, you are. While you are rested, you're refreshed, and you're like the uh, the island national team boys in the Leicester team. You haven't had much to do in the last two weeks. <laughs> what a great intro! Thanks, man. And yes, it's so good to be back. Yeah, sure. Uh, and unlike Sexton, who only gets sent one place to rest up, I uh, I did a little bit of a little bit of a road trip through South Africa. I uh, I didn't wear shoes for a couple of weeks, which I always enjoy. Um, but yeah, up in Addo and uh, which was incredible. Um, and then I took some back roads driving up to Addo, um, like almost in inland, not on the coast. And then on the way back, I drove on the coast and then we went to, to the Otsunikwa forest in Nisner. So I spent a couple of days in the bush there or in the forest there. So yeah, it was great. A great break and, and rest. Um, and let's see how the rest of uh, winter treats me. <laughs> Let's see indeed. So we didn't put up a first phase for the week, but there was a video that came from, straight from the main, from Major League Rugby, which caught pretty much everyone's eye in the rugby world this morning. So we wake up to um, former Bulls coach um, Porta Human um, getting himself in a scrap with the conditioning coach of the... So Porta Human's the head coach of the Houston Sabercats. And he was, um, I think it's called the New York... New York Jacks? I'm not R- sure. Rag- no, rugby, rugby New York. Rugby United rugby New, York. New York. There we go. And they, he got into an altercation with the conditioning coach. Jared, if I'm not mistaken, it seemed like the conditioning coach had something to say about the Houston players and Porter decided to give him some, let's call it Praetorian hospitality. Yeah, I think a lot of people uh, will just call it a PK, Tala. I think that's, that's the uh, general term. But <laughs> That's not a penalty kick. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that's the accurate way of describing it because you won't often see a, a, a big oak like him um, go go without a fist unless it's a PK. So I, I think he connected quite well, and uh, yeah, it, it's it was mad scenes to see that. Like you don't often see something like that on a rugby pitch, and yeah, I think it's Squidge that often says that the MRR is just like the American version of the Pro D2 and like situations like this is just like straight up Pro D2 shit. Um, I'm sure now, I'm sure you remember um, had an autoquiz uh, father also came onto the pitch in one of those fr- uh, French games. I think that might have been the old school top 14, but uh, that's, that's the craziest thing I've seen uh, happen in that kind of context since, since that, uh, since that fight. Yeah, like oh, passion is flowing, man. And I mean, uh, Heineken Mayer is at, at the Sabercats as well. Isn't he director of rugby there? But I tell yeah. you what's very interesting is I just, obviously so many South Africans were talking about it and obviously a lot of the journos, no put him on from Lions and whatever. But the guys were talking and obviously the conversation went around like, you know, how would it have ended up if they went at each other? And Puerto Humans from grew up in dispatch or something, didn't he? Um, if if that's yeah. the case, and then he also coached in Pretoria, that's he's got a pretty strong pedigree. Um, whether he's whether he's not good at bo- at boxing or not, um, he's uh, he he will be able to handle himself. So, yeah, very oof, very interesting. But then this other guy, I forget his name, the conditioning coach is uh, involved in um in some sort of contact sport martial arts type setup as well so it would have been quite interesting mm. his name is ollie richardson the high performance coach of rugby ny yeah so i think let's get a few um an impromptu first phase sean i'll start with you what are some of the coaching cards or who are the top ranked coach fighters that you would um <laughs> that, that that would hold their own in a fight yeah i I tell you the very, very first thing that came to mind when I was thinking about this was um, 
um, when we talk about like combos later, I'll, I'll jump into the other one that I picked up off social. But the very first I thought about was, didn't Rob Dupree Sr., wasn't he a South African kickboxer? I'm, I'm almost certain... I'm almost certain he was a kickboxer of some sorts. I mean, he was a he was a big scrum off back in the day, but he also didn't take any cuck. And I have this funny feeling that he was a kickboxer. So I would say that in the mix now, if I had to talk, look at the South Africans, I'd probably would say that he would probably he would probably be the the baddest of the lot. Can we count him as a head coach though, or as a coach? Don't know. Does, does his <laughs> record stand up during sleep. the Sharks or what? <laughs> <laughs> That's, I, I was clutching there. It was all I had, man. It was all I had. Chad, what are, what are your, what are your um, top picks for this category? I, I, I think uh, Warren Gatlin would be a good shot, to be honest. A former hooker um, mm. going outside of the South African context. But uh, I, a former hooker, he looks like the... Uh, he looks like a pretty hard man. And uh, I think uh, in the same breath, Paul O'Connell, we saw what he did on a rugby pitch. Him mm-hmm. and Andy Farrell could make a decent uh, fighting combo for, for Ireland. Um, but I, I, I think Eddie Jones is definitely in the, in the mix here. Like, Tala, I know you, I you know your, your WWE uh, fighters and like an old Eddie Guerrero <laughs> lie. He cheats, he steals, he'll do anything to win. I reckon he'll. He'll punch somebody in the nads for the, at the slightest opportunity, and then stick his fingers in their eyes. Like, so, oh, so I'm back in Eddie, like full on dirty farting, mm-hmm. and he's got it. I think if you take that aside, like I do think I, I reckon Eddie could could take a couple of punches, but I reckon he will latch onto you and he will not let go. Like mm-hmm. he will just once the once the mist comes over, he will get in your space because he's a small guy. He'll get in your space and he'll just be punching you, like whether it's your kidneys or your face or whatever, and he just won't stop. Like just the and he was pure also a volume back in the day. Yeah, he, the pure volume of punches that come through to you, I think, will probably just end. You'll be pissing blood for a couple of weeks. But what about Rusty? R- Rusty, ah, R- Rusty could get could could mix it up. Yeah, he's, he's I think he's quite, a, he's quite a tall oak as well, so he's got a decent reach. So I think he will, he will be a you know, decent shot. And uh, yeah, I, I also thought about Brad Thorne. Well, we, immediately when you said Rossi, I thought of Brad Thorne. And yeah, he also just looks, he looks like he's just got mallets for hands. So I think that would be very unpleasant for anyone that comes up against him. The other, the other one, and it's quite ironic considering he's just been suspended. But um, oh, sorry, yeah, is uh, is Di Young? Yeah, Di Young, Steve Diamond. I, I reckon the Premiership and the URC have got a whole bunch of coaches that could just really get stuck in. But Di Young and Steve Diamond, never in a million years would I get involved in anything if it was unsavory with uh, any of those. And William Savart, I. Oh, <laughs> Sean Edwards must also have a bit of a claim there. I mean, crazy mm-hmm. person from the north of England, as I guess Andy Farrell does as well. But I think just bringing another division, if we're having different divisions for these fights, I mean, I think we've talked about a few South Africans. I think Nenob would be the more threatening person than Rassi, IMO. Um, even John Dobson, he has crazy eyes. I, I wouldn't trust him <laughs> you know, going one-on-one with him. But I think in the Pacific New Zealand Australia division, we haven't considered Pat Lamb. That's I think he would absolutely like throttle someone yeah. if, he, if he if he needs to. Yeah, I, 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 that's a great shot. I, oh, I think that's a great. Yeah, he's um he he'll he'll go badass. You know, I'm trying to I'm trying to think of who these guys, some of these guys that we've just kind of overlooked that. It seemed like they're too nice, but the mist, right. the mist will come. Well, we can go, Christoph Aureus. He's constantly blown off the off the chart. And, yeah, he, it doesn't count because give, we've seen what give he can him do. half a chance. Give him half a chance, and Ronan O'Car <laughs> is looking like he did back in the on the Lions tour. In the Lions tour, <laughs> <laughs> remember that. I was about to say. I was about to say if we're going on the opposite end, Ronan O'Car is definitely at the, the bottom of the rankings here. Yeah, I'll give him but no he's, chance. He's Sorry, typical, 
He's typical chirp chirp and then and then get away. Um, I've just pulled up a list here of uh, of of some some coaches. So I tell you, Alex Sanderson, he's at sale. Mm. Eh? Oof, yeah, talk about crazy odds. That guy also. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he could throw it down. And uh, and Dean Richards is another one. I reckon back in the day, back in the day, one hundred percent. He had a bit of a reputation for that. Yeah, and, yeah. and is um, is uh, Razor too much of a uh, a softy now? And we see him too much of no. the dancer. We're not going to take him that's, on. No, that's that's who. That's exactly who I was talking about. Like, who's this person that we kind of think is is not there? He was a he was a flipping Lucy back in the day, and back in those days, punches were basically how you played rugby. And now he surfs and dances and wins titles and is going to coach the All Blacks. So you kind of overlook him. No way is that guy's soft. And the best mm. part about it is he looks like he looks like he's all chilled and everything. Oh, I've got a great one, John Mitchell. Yeah, I, there's I, a guy. I, I, I there's a guy. Great. I reckon he. I reckon he's the winner. I th- I reckon. When it comes to any one-on-one with any coach, I reckon John Mitchell wins. That oak, that oak has got some red mist. He's, he's dangerous. Very, very quick story. Um, in high school, I was a, um, like one of the people that would go to these like, um, like road shows um, around KZN, just encouraging people to come to uh, Madison College. And this one road show was in Durban, and it was in the, what, 2011. So it's still at the time when John Plumtree and Dude Australia were involved with the Sharks. And both of them actually were there, I think, to see what, what's, what's cutting for their children. Plumtree's hand is absolutely massive. It, like, engulfed my hand. I've, he absolutely just broke my hand when he was trying to shake my hand. So that was quite embarrassing <laughs> for me. And Rudolf Strani is the size of, I don't even know, like a, 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 mini, a mini flat in Cape Town, probably. Like, that man is humongous. <laughs> I, I can understand why the Springboks did what they had to do in 2003. I mean, how can you say no to that man? Yeah, he's a, he's a big guy. Big, big human. We're probably missing out on Strali here because uh, he probably did that, um, those bare knuckle box scenes just so he could find, like, a worthy opponent. <laughs> and... Even Bucky's boy to like flatten somebody and he was just like, no, nah, not good enough. And like, that's why it all, it all came out because he told them that they all, they all weak and they weren't matching up to him. Brilliant. <laughs> Starting some cool. conspiracies yeah, here, gents. But the, I think the last one that I want to chuck out there is uh, Johan Ackermann. Isn't he from like Brackpan yes. or Boxburg or something like that? Yeah, but they're, they're ready. Oh, he looks oh, so nice <laughs> yeah, he's, but he's con- he, he had he's just gone. lost as well for farting. Do you know? Hmm. Do you know that? Um, so he played. Um, he played at Hammies for a little bit before he went uh, uh, back to Joburg or to Joburg to go coach and whatnot. And I remember meeting him like before training and busy chatting, and we did a session where we were playing against the first. Fortunately, it wasn't like massively full contact, but I was a back, so it was easy for me to hide away. But I tell you, the one thing, there was two things that stood out for me. And the one was, it was a very much a first impression thing. He had the biggest forearms I've ever seen in my life. Like, like, I, I don't know. He had like Popeye, Popeye arms. His forearms looked like those, like where you just like, that's all you can see. Like they were just massive and muscles and it's, it's, it's farm muscles. It's not gym muscles. Like it's, it's ridiculous. And the other thing that, that stood out for me when I watched him play games is I never, ever saw him running, but he always was the first at the ruck or always had the ball, but he, he knew all the shortcuts. He was incredible, but that obviously club rugby's from the level where he played is, is quite different, but, um, uh, like, yeah, but, but the biggest forearms I've ever seen in my life. Crazy. Yeah. So the rugby was some Twitter um, ch- um, page. We'll probably get a few fighting cards and some pull- pulls and, and everything, so that we can see what the what the rest of the rugby world thinks about these things. But let's get on to matters on the field, and that is the last round of the of the of the URC. Let's start with the match that happened on Friday from a South African perspective, which is the Stormers beating Benetton thirty eight points to twenty two to. Um, secure um, third place on the URC log. 
They're going to be facing the Bulls in the quarterfinal at home. And the Stormers, you know, had some good news with regards to welcoming back Evan Ruiz into the starting team. Um, and and they were able to also welcome back um, Angelo Davids into the team as well. And a bit of a struggle. Benetton obviously gave them a match, but at the end of the day, the Stormers were able to, 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 to take it for themselves. Um, I'll start with Jared. Uh, I don't think there's too much that's been dramatic about sort of the Stormers in the last few weeks, um, but it does seem like their form is heading maybe in the wrong direction. It doesn't seem like they are getting better. It seems like they are slightly just sort of fading a bit back from where they were end of last season, start of this season. Yeah, I, th- I think that's a bit fair. Um, I, I do also think they've been hit with injuries and, yeah, every team has their injuries. You look at the Sharks, but I, I think they started to coast a little bit and got a little bit um, complacent. And, yeah, I think against Bedenton, it was a little bit sharper from them, but it was almost like they took the foot off the accelerator and they had the win in the bag and they just cruised to the victory. And, yeah, you, you can't blame them too much for that. They did make a few changes and tried a few things rested a few players so yeah i think they're in a good space for the for the playoffs um they would have preferred to have a home semi-final if they reached the semi-final but uh i I still think it's it's a decent position for them to be in at the moment i don't think it's uh quite a, a slum that they're going into i think it's they got knocked back um last week against Munster, and it's sort of Good timing because you getting that victory, that defeat out the way before the playoffs come. Yeah, I think that's really that's a really good point. That's hopefully they get that sort of bad match out of their system. Sean, I think just to talk about individuals, and we'll probably do this uh, in a few weeks once the season finishes. But if we're talking about players of the season and, and all that sort of stuff, Dan Duplessis must be high up there for the Stormers. He had another man of the match performance. He was. You know, he, he went to 13 this weekend with David Villas at Big 12, still made a ton of meters, still working hard around the field, beating a lot of defenders. Like he's, I mean, yeah, for, for people that were fans of him, like when he was playing at high school, and I was one of them, I think it's great to see the potential being realized in this player. Yeah, he's, <clears throat> for me, they're, they're two players. Um, and, um, but he's definitely one, and he's one in the backs. I'm very interested to see how they balance that 12-13 combo moving forward because I, for one, think Ruan now has to play or has to start. So I'm very interested to see what they do because obviously between Dan, for me, has got, got to start and you have to start Willemse as well. So then do you not play now? But in my world, I would rather have now playing at 13 and have Dan at 12 or Willemse at 12. But Dan's been incredible. Like he's really moved a lot around the back line. He's moved in and out of the team. He's covered where need be and everything. And from being essentially what is like a, a fringe stroke cover player, as in not a core player, he's played himself into being a core member of the side, which is huge. So yeah, he's he's been great. There's a very interesting balancing act coming coming up now, and it's you can't make any mistakes when you name your sides from now on. You know, you lose a match and, and you're out. Just on that, I mentioned there's two players. For me, the other one is BJ Dixon. I think Dixon has been head and shoulders the best player in the Stormers' side. He's been the most improved. The irony is I thought he was more um, a lock stroke flank, but it so finds out that he's probably more a flank stroke lock because he's been playing some of his best rugby on the side of the scrum. So for me, between Dan Dupassi and BJ Dixon are the Stormers' player, players of the season, without a doubt. You know, I would, I would also throw into the mix Marvel Ari, who I think has just been yes. a mainstay in the pack, especially with yes. um, Salah Murat being out for the whole season. I think he's, yeah, man, he's a workhorse. Obviously, he's a bit of a uh, in that sort of Peter Mani nuisance category as well as we saw last week. And yeah, I think he does his job really well uh, in that respect. That he's the sort of player that does give. Um, obviously, the Stormers have a great front row, but he does enable the Stormers to have that grant up front and he has the work rates to do what he needs to do in the rucks as well. We all know how Wally, like 
the numbers that he yeah. hits with like racks and tackles and touch ball. He's he's been class. I I've 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 really liked him the last couple of seasons. Um I've been fighting for him a little bit because he's quite polarizing in that uh, many people you either really like him or you don't like him. And it's more that the don't likes um, are out there with regards to Ori. He does so much work. He's, he's that, he's a, he's a glue in that pack. And with, with the issues they've had with injury and, and stuff, I honestly don't think the Stormers would have been as competitive without him being there. So, you know, you show me you show me anyone that plays on the edge that doesn't concede a few penalties and as as his personality is like he wants to get in your face and he's rough and, and that's just the way he is. Like I don't believe he's a, a good player if he stops that. You know, I think that's the kind of play is like you've got to be all in you, you know, like Evan. Evan's gotta be he's got the red miss has got to be there. You can't give Evan it's about the captaincy because it doesn't suit him. His style is is to be the the, the bad guy. So yeah, I think I agree with you totally in with regards to Marvin Ori. He's uh, he's been really good. He's been like there was talk of a moneyball moneyball um, players on um, on Twitter, um, but he's one of those moneyball players when he came to the Stormers. I feel I think they would have got a really good deal on him, and he's been uh, he's been class. I'm so, I'm shocked if no one made the money money Labok um, joke in that thread at all. Um, the one negative for the Stormers, um, Jared, um, happened, I think, in the 25th minute with the Ivan Rus yellow card, which um, I think we're probably still waiting to hear if there is going to be further sighting of it uh, this week. Yeah, it was basically a situation where I think the, I, I think it was probably Lazaroni that was holding the, the, the player in the ruck. It was and then Solani. Ivan Rus took a bit of it. Was Solani, yeah. yeah. And then Ruiz took a bit of an exception to it and pushed his head to the ground. I think he's probably a bit lucky not to get a red card there, Jared. Yeah, I, I, I had a few conversations on Twitter about it, and I think it quite easily could have been a red card, especially um, around the safeties that rugby is having at the moment, so around uh, head safety. So it could have easily been there. He started, He pushed him from the start in the head straight into the ground. So yeah, it really could have been a red card. Um, I think um, the Benetton player Zlani was also a bit lucky he didn't get any kind of um, telling off for his actions. Um, but Ruiz also did push him into um, JJ Corsa. So yeah, I, I think it was just a bad. It was a bad look for for Irvin. Um, like you, you want to uh, you want to show the coaches that you have your teammates back in and. You want to um, make your mark because it was his first um, start since coming back from injury. So you can understand it can get all a bit heated and you do see that red mist, but it was just, it was so stupid and it was so silly. I mean, the Stormers were knocking down the door looking for a try and all of a sudden they down a man and they 20 meters back kind of thing. So yeah, it was a, it was a nasty one from Russ. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, it's, he's had, two similar situations um from last season and yeah it's it's stuff that you you want that, that extra little bit of grunt and that peter omani off the ball like getting in the opponent's heads but you don't want it to cost your team and luckily the stormers were just a different class to what benetton were but if that happens against a team like leinster they're gonna make you pay for it And then Jared again, just on the positive side on 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 um um on the Benetton um side of the match, I think they probably take the the award for the try of the day. Um, can you tell at least people about what you thought about the Thomas Gallo assist for? Oh, um, no, that was Alexander's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just beautiful to see a lucid uh, prop sprinting in free space like that. Like we've seen it with. Um, <laughs> With Ox when he scored that try for the Cheetahs, I think that was his Curry Cup debut or something, or, or his first try in the Curry Cup. We've seen that with him, Shunu. So yeah, it was just brilliant to see. And I always forget how rapid Gallo is until he makes a break, and he showed it. So yeah, the, what was that? Uh, the flanker's name, um, Isako. He he was also just yeah. absolutely brilliant. And 
yeah, Willemsen made a decent attempt to get him down, but his finish uh, right at the end was just superb. Like, it's one of those forward tries that you just want to hang up on a wall and carry on watching for the rest of the weekend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Benetton did rotate their team. They prepared for a big um, Challenge Cup semi final against Toulon. So there was a bit of rotation. But yeah, they gave themselves a very good account. Only a few points out of the top eight. They could have maybe snuck in if results went their way and they were able to pick up one of these matches. But yeah, I think they can be pretty happy with the season that they've had um, on that side. And the Stormers, they're going to face the Bulls in two weeks' time. And yeah, we will have to, we'll probably talk about this more in detail next week. But yeah, I think the Stormers will obviously be favorites against a team that they have a very good record against. So let's move to the Lions, who at that stage, knew now that they couldn't really do anything or get back or get into the top eight. So they played against Zebra, and I guess both defensive coaches decided to take a day off, Sean. I, I think it was just decided before the match there was going to be an exhibition. So 85 points scored, Lions get 50, Zebra have 35. 13 tries were scored in this match as well. And yeah, there was definitely a, more of an exhibition match than it was a serious, like, defensive, like, battle yeah i'd tell you it's definitely a, a game where the defensive coaches are pulling their hair out but um conversely i think the lions would obviously be happier with that result with having won but also scored 50 it's always great scoring 50 points um and uh make it a a nice expansive and enjoyable game for everyone everyone to watch i'm sure a couple of the big boys shed a few kilograms uh with so much rain but um, it is what it is. Uh, but a, a good result and, a, and a, great, a great end for the Lions. Like, it was a good way to end their season and um, sort of start prepping for the new season. And then just to keep you short, um, I, I, I know you're a big fan of um, Lions scrum off um, Sanel Noamba, who's, I think, the last few months, especially since the turn of the year, has just played really, really good rugby. Yeah. Yeah, see, it's... The thing is, is at the Lions... He, I was bummed when he left the shocks. Like, there's no two ways about it. Because initially, especially in the under twenties, I thought that he was a better option at nine than than Jaden. Um, obviously, been proved wrong in the long run about that. But I still think Nahamba's got got the goods to to go a little bit further um, uh, and hopefully get a look in at the Springbok squad somewhere along the line. But his move to the Lions has been an interesting one because it started off like a house on fire, and then he had a uh, he had a, he had some, tr- some troubling times in games and nice pulled it back and he's starting to become that player that we were hoping he would he would be and maintain so that's good um i'm loving it uh you know he's a he's, he's a great I, I just want him to have a little bit more stability around him a little bit more structure because i think like he's it almost looks so much that he's just playing heads up rugby more often than not to be fair i think the lions have been playing a lot of heads, heads up rugby as it is but um, i'm looking forward to see how this team but him grows because he's such a vital part of it and um you know he he's he's important for them in moving forward yeah and the biggest thing hopefully will be that there's a big not for sale sign over most of these um great young lines players because it does look like there's something you know that that's coming together there and you know if, if there's a bit of investment if this team stays together there's no reason why they can't you know have the same sort of success they can't have this season. Jared, if we take a bit of a, we can do this, uh, we'll probably do this um, later, but if we take a uh, bird's eye view over the season and if we want to give maybe or single out a few lines for potential players of the season and all that sort of stuff, Jared, who, who would come to mind for you for that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's the easy one when it comes to the lines and that's Marius Lowe. Like, um, yeah, we sort of uh, said it was a bit of a blow for the Sharks to to lose him. But when Ron came in and they ended up getting Francois Fenter, it looked like the Sharks came out on the better end of the of the deal. But yeah, he's he's been excellent at the lines. Uh, he's taken over the captaincy in his first season. I think he's been outstanding. I'd be pressed to say he's probably the signing of the URC. Like I can't think of a, another player maybe maybe just via feature that has been had such a 
great impact in his first season at the side. So I think he's definitely up there. Um, yeah, I, I, Ed Wall van der Mav is always such a joy to watch. And uh, yeah, it would have been great if they had Henku van Veek on the inside. Oh, well, outside center. But uh, yeah, those are sort of my big picks from them. Um, but yeah, I think we also just need to give a shout out to Yaku Creel, who played his last game, ended up getting on the score sheet. He's one of the few remaining OGs from that um, tw- uh, that Johan Ackermann side that went to three Super Rugby finals and yeah, struggled with injuries throughout his uh, career, but a hell of a player and yeah, got to play for the Springboks, got to captain the Lions. Not a bad, not a bad uh, innings in the end. Yeah, and I think just in terms of a legend for the Lions, he can definitely count himself as one, especially having being able to come back into the team. So yeah, happy retirements for him as well. And I think he has hopefully left a good seed for, you know, this new Lions loose trio of um, Chituka, Fenter, and um, Frankie Horn to run with as well. Sean, any other players you'd like to shout out in that um, play of the season discussion for the Lions? No, <laughs> um, I, uh, Maurice Lowe would have been mine. I think uh, uh, him and um, and Frankie Horn have been have been standouts. Um, obviously, we spoke about Maurice Lowe, but I think Frankie Horn. We've spoken about him this whole season uh, when he's played. We've always mentioned him. He's always done something on the rugby field. So, as as a forward and as a back, um, Horn and and Lowe for me. Yeah, I, I would. Also, just quickly shout out, um, I think also just in terms of golden oldies, Willem Alberts, I think, has really come back well during the season. I had my sort of doubts about him, but I think he really um, put in a big shift in the last few weeks here. But he's been near sort of the top of like tactic stats and all that sort of stuff uh, recently. And on the other side of the scale, Ron Fenter, I mean, this weekend, I was just watching him in the, at least in the second half. He was on the scrum off and the and, and Zebra's case about them doing that caterpillar rack, and he caught them out. I think at least two or three times um, during the second half. And I mean, that's good to show the rugby intelligence with obviously the physical gifts that he has. So, yeah, obviously you have a big future to look forward with him as well. Let's move to the Bulls. I think this will be a quick discussion. The Bulls beat um, a random school touring team from Leinster, sixty-two points to seven. Um, a lot of tries for the Bulls, nine tries to one. Backline looking good. Uh, Jared, I think the, the main question is, are, are, is this thing sustainable that the Bulls have beaten in the last three weeks? I think it's the Griquas, Zebra, and Leicester, what, C or D team? Or, so is this sustainable for, for the Bulls? Is something they can take forward for the Stormers? Or is this just a matter of they played some weak opposition in the last few weeks? Yeah, I think I think it's a it's a bit of both. Um, like a Leinster team is, it's not easy to put a Leinster team away, even if it is um, Reese Ruddock's children that uh, they're playing against. So yeah, I I, th- I think there is a little bit that they can take from these games. Um, yeah, to rack up those kinds of scores, it's still pretty difficult. Um, even against Leinster, it's their biggest defeat in Leinster's history that the Bulls gave them. So. So yeah, yeah, I think you have to give them uh, plaudits for that. But I think it's it's definitely a morale booster for the team, and I think they were down on that. And we've we've highlighted the quality that the Bulls do have in their squad. And when they have those guys playing, and when I say those guys, I mean specifically Kurtley Orenson and Caden Mooney. When they are cooking then the Bulls are cooking and they can actually get a result. So I think the the Stormers will be very wary of what uh, Jake's side can bring. And having someone like Aurich Lowe in your pack as well is just, it's it's not fair game. So, so yeah, I, I think the, the Stormers will be very wary of what's going on, but you do need to take the results with a pinch of salt. I think... Uh... One of the unsung heroes in that Bulls side this season um, and someone who I believe will the Springbok selectors will be keeping an eye on is Ambrose Papi. Um, I know it's going to upset a lot of people that I said that, but 
you can't deny the form that he's in. He's He's been playing. He hasn't played bad rugby. The Bulls have played badly and lost, but he hasn't been playing badly. He's had, he's been really, really good. Now, I I tell you, we, we still umming and ahhing about that, that third scrum half um, and, and wondering oh, yeah. what's going on. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think that Reinach is, um, is possibly not as dead set to go as we, as we think he is. So, and we've got Hendricks is injured, so he should come back, but what form is he going to come back in? So we've got, we've got Williams, Faf, um, Yanchis, who's been poor and, and coming, coming good. I think Ambrose Papier should definitely be in that conversation. We've got we've got lots of nines. It's about making sure that everyone's on form. So it's going to be be interesting. I know I know I've probably got hate mail from Jared already about saying that about uh, about Reinach. I want him to go. I just don't think that he's as as dead set to go as as many people think. Yeah, I, I think part of the problem is uh, he's playing in the top fourteen and Montpellier aren't really um, as They're brilliant as they were last lot. season. And yeah, uh, we're yeah. sort of not keeping a closer eye on the top 14 as we have previously. I'm an eye. I just, mm. No, yeah. I, that's what I'm saying is don't... that we're not looking at the nitty gritty of his game yeah. and that kind of thing. So I think I, I think Reinach and uh, Faf are the two scrum offs that are dead set to go to the World Cup. And it's that third scrum off. And it, if Jaden is fit, I think it's Jaden. And then if Jaden's not fit, then, after then that it's, Williams. it's open doors. So. Yeah, I, I'd love oh, for, for it to Williams. be Williams, but I think it, it will yeah. probably be Yankees um, because of how much he knows the system. And if it's not Yankees, I, I, th- I think Papi definitely deserves a mention and deserves another look in because he has been playing superbly. But when you've got so many options in, at Scrum Half, they're probably going to favor experience if um, yeah. the, the skill set is, is all there. So. That gives Reinach and Yankees a, le- a leg up on on the rest. Yeah, I think I think Papier gets a look in with a squad pick somewhere because we'll be selecting four or five squads before the World Cup, maybe three. Sorry, maybe three or four. I reckon he gets a look in with one of the squads. Wouldn't be surprised. Um, but agree in terms of World Cup, I think we're pretty set in on it. But I think he's going to get a look in again. Sorry, I jumped in. And then um, just to give, I mean, I gave Sean a bit of um, a treat with talking about Nam, but let's give Jared a bit of a treat because a certain um, Marcel Kutsia is going to come back or should be scheduled to come back to the Bulls uh, basically in the next week or so. He's probably going to be available for the quarterfinal um, from at least what's, what's been said. He's definitely going to make a big um, difference to the Bulls and their quarterfinal hopes. Yeah, I, I think he's a massive boost for the for the Bulls. I mean, all of a sudden they're playing a back row of Kutsia, uh, Arik Lowe, and um, Marku van Staden with uh, Karl Brunk coming off of the bench. So that immediately is huge for them. Um, so yeah, it's it's a massive, massive boost and a timely one at that. And uh, from what I saw from the quick highlights that I was able to catch from his time in Japan, he was he was playing quite well. So. Just having a look at his stats, he averaged ten carries and ten carry and ten tackles per game, which is it's pretty good work for for your number eight blind side, whatever he was, uh, whatever you're playing sort of thing. And he grabbed four tries as well, so a pretty good going um, in Japan in a very fast paced um, league that arguably doesn't suit him as well as uh, it would other players. So. So yeah, we we might uh, get a little bit of a slimmer Marcel Kutsia coming to the Bulls, which will only make him even more dangerous. I reckon. Uh, he, I don't think he would have lost any of that physicality on attack or defense. So, so yeah, it's a, it's it's a very very big uh, boost for the Bulls. But uh, we we're probably going to have um, Dion Free back for the Stormers as well. So we they'll go up against a back three of. Uh, a, a loose trio of uh, Dion Fury, Achiva Daimani, or Billy Ingel Brach, maybe, and Ivan Ruiz. So, so yeah, that's that's going to be an exciting battle to look forward to. 
And then Sean, gun to your head. If you're Jake White, is it Jan Horsen or Chris Smith starting in two weeks' time? Probably Horsen after after this weekend. Um, I, I, we're all waiting for Horsen to put in a couple of performances together in a row, but that's only going to happen if you pick him in a row. So I reckon <laughs> I reckon you go I reckon you go with Horsen. Papi and Horsen, nine ten starters definitely. Mm. Yeah, and we'll see how that goes in a few in a few weeks' time. Let's move to the final match of the weekend on a Thomas African perspective, which is the Sharks facing Munster. And yeah, I, I don't and the Sharks have shocked. I think there's a, a phrase that um premiership, English premiership, um football premiership um, fans use for Tottenham Hotspurs, where they get themselves into situations where they find a loss where a win was only possible, which is called being Spursy. And I think the, 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 we should debut a new phrase for the Sharks and call it uh, for when they put themselves in a losing position after winning, uh, being Sharks. Because the Sharks were leading 22 points to three. Things were going well. They had a scrum that was absolutely killing uh, Munster. And then all of a sudden, they just gave away all the all the advantage that they had, even with Peter Marnie having a yellow card um, in the 50th minute. Um <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we say the same things that we do every week. Um, but Jared, the Sharks have now the Sharks only managed to draw against Master, twenty two all, and they're now eighth um in the URC log. They still have a small, small chance of making the Champions Cup. Uh, maybe you can explain that. Just talk me through why are we talking about the same things about the Sharks every week. Yeah, that, that I don't know about, Tyler. Like, I, I think I put it out on Twitter that uh, the Sharks have um, too many bullets to shoot themselves in the foot. And uh, they had every opportunity to to beat Munster this weekend and put them away, and they just wasted it. So, so yeah, if, if they want to play Champions Cup next uh, season, there's a very easy route, and that's uh, going to Dublin and knocking over Leinster, easy stuff, um, beat whoever wins between Glasgow and Munster, which will probably be probably be Glasgow, I would say, just because they're at home, and then beat uh, whoever wins on the other side of the draw. That's so, a massive shot. Yeah. Why is that a massive shot? Think, Glasgow have been fantastic at home. They have been, but I think, man, oof, it's a great shot. Sorry, I just yeah, thought it, I'd say it, that. It, it, you, they've, got Peter Omar, they've got Peter Omani, so they, whenever you have war guard on your side, you, you've you got a good chance. But uh, yeah, but just Glasgow at home, Huey Pilato in the centres. I, I, I think Glasgow Oof. have got the edge. Okay, we'll talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's that's pretty much the, the route that the Sharks need to qualify for the uh, Champions Cup. And that's because... Um, the URC give a Champions Cup spot to all of the Shield winners. So there was the Stormers, Cardiff, uh, Leinster that won those uh, those Shields. So, so that's why. Um, so yeah, if if they do win it, then they would take um, Connacht's place in um, the Champions Cup next season if the Sharks do it. Which uh, the Sharks will shark it like uh, like Tala put there. So interesting, interestingly enough, um, the Bulls and Connacht could miss out on Champions Cup next year if the Sharks win the URC and Benetton win the uh, Challenge Cup. <laughs> can you believe it? Imagine. Yeah. Imagine the shit yeah, that and, can come uh, pouring all down. All the Scarlets. Yeah, all the Scarlets, yeah. Oh, yes. I didn't see that. My <laughs> bad. Crazy. So yeah, why maybe sure we can go to you as well, but like yeah, is there anything new we can say about the Sharks, or is it just the same old stuff? Like they'll play well for about twenty thirty minutes and then just forget to defend basically for the rest of the game. Yeah, <clears throat> you know if you watch that Sharks game and if you just want to know if you want to watch the whole Sharks season in eighty minutes, you watch that game because that's pretty much how it's unfolded. Like it's been shit good the whole way through. There's only two things I want to say about the game. One is Sia Kulisi coming off injured. I We're all just holding thumbs that he doesn't uh, have a serious injury that'll hurt his World Cup. And the other thing was give Oxenchair all the cake. That man, he was a flippin' beast. He was scrummaging people into the ground. 
and then he was making one-on-one tackles when Anton Frisch was having a go at him and he was at fullback. I mean, you're going to put your money on a backline player. Well, if you didn't know it was Oxen Chair, you'd put your money on a backline player, but I think everyone would have rather it would have, would have picked Oxen Chair to make that tackle. So the guy's a guy's an absolute legend in some serious form. So loving that. But yeah, as for the Sharks, it's uh, season what couple one more game, maybe three more games left of their season. But as soon as it ends, the better I feel for the Sharks, um, so they can start looking ahead. It's uh, yeah, it's been quite quite hectic. But Jared. Um, <clears throat> What uh, have you heard anything about Khaleesi? Did you see the game? Because nothing official has come out yet. I just know that the way that he fell didn't look great. Yeah, they they said uh, they would know more by today. So I I don't think uh, Neil Powell will be giving up an update just yet. So we'll we'll probably by the time the podcast comes out, we'll probably learn a bit more about uh, Khaleesi's injury. Um, yeah, you're right. It did look a bit. Uh, did look a bit harsh and uh yeah i i see a lot of south african fans are piling on uh peter omani at the moment and uh they want a little bit more fuel um the reason that happened to see uh is because omani takes uh vanna cook just out of play when lucano passes so instead of the pass <laughs> going to vanna it goes to see a Khaleesi and uh, uh you, yeah so it's all peter you're starting a witch yeah, jump under <laughs> <laughs> I can literally there was Twitter was literally alive with with everyone having a go at Mahoney and um and, and like it was basically the South Africans against War God versus the Irish supporting War God where last week the tables were turned and this week yeah. oh no and Jared you can't say him, that. Mate. I just love him. I and, really do. <laughs> he I also came he, up with a classic chip. Fav- my favorite Irish player. I, I I can pretty much comfortably say that at the moment. Since CJ Stunder retired, you, you know, I used to love CJ Stunder and yeah, a lot of South African fans don't, but yeah, I always against the grain. And I, I do love uh, Peter Omani. Such, such a quality player. You can't make up for what you just said. And there's nothing you can say that'll make up for it. Tyler, I'm going to just pass that on to you and then we can go off this topic because Jared's trying to dig himself out of this hole. <laughs> Oh, no, I, I'm just I, yeah. I <laughs> no, yeah, it doesn't look too good with um, Rachel Colisi's um, recent Instagram post. It does look like uh, it, it might be a, a long-term injury. So yeah, let's all hold fun, thumbs and pray that it is not a big injury because obviously Colisi is not only a big star for South Africa, but a big star for the whole rugby world. The rugby world cup will need. So it's. So basically, this leaves us with, I think we've touched on most of the teams, but the full URC quarterfinals, we'll talk about the next week in detail, is Leinster is facing the Sharks in Dublin. They've just confirmed they're going to be playing, uh, playing in the Aviva Stadium, so not going to be playing in the big stadium, so it's pretty much almost an Ireland versus South Africa game in the Aviva again. Then we have, um, in that side of the pool, is Glasgow against Munster. Glasgow can be coming from the Challenge Cup semi-final that weekend. And then on the other side of the draw will be Ulster facing Connacht. Connacht have done fantastically to qualify for the um, Champions Cup um, quarterfinals, especially after the start that they had and they had the early tour to Africa. And I think they've won, I think it's one, they, they only had one loss and they lost eight or nine, something along those lines. So they've done really well. And there'll be an Irish derby. And then the other match will be the Stormers versus the Bulls, which will be a South African derby. Um, we all know what that is all about. Stormers have a big run, um, you know, being unbeaten in South Africa for, for for a while and being unbeaten, especially against the Bulls for a long time as well. So I think all four will be big matches. Very quickly, guys, the away team you back the most to get a surprise victory is... Sharks. Sharks. <laughs> of course. Sean? Monster. Okay. Let's move to the Champions Cup semi-finals. Just to Tala, you're not gonna up. you're not gonna put and... yours in. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting. <laughs> I'm also <laughs> sitting here. I was like, I was scratching my head, going, "Wait, well, hang on a second. Have you just somehow managed to avoid that?" It's <laughs> gonna dummy that one. I, I'd probably say Munster. I'll I'll say the Bulls just for vibes, though, just just to make things. That's actually a great um, 
Yeah, I'll probably watch them actually. Um, I think the tickets have just gone out, so I'll. Why don't you use Jared's season, season tickets? Use Jared's season tickets. It doesn't work in Cape Town. It only works in Loftus. Oh, fair <laughs> enough. So let's move to the Champions Cup semi-finals. Obviously, massive matches there. We've got you know less of us to lose. I don't know if we should call that a classico now. And then um, we've got the La Rochelle, the defending champions, facing um, Exeter. So let's start with the match of the weekend. It sounds like from the news coming out that Leinster will not have um, Johnny Sexton is definitely out. Um, it's I thought he might just sneak back somehow, but he's he's out. Vernon Kelleher's out, and James Lowe's out for the week. It seems like uh, uh, Josh van der Fleer and uh, Ryan Bed might hopefully you know it'll be depend on fitness tests. To lose, I think there's no real big injury news or new injury sure. news. I think everyone came through. Or did, did I miss something, Jared? Yeah, they've got a pretty long list. I, I I glanced over it over the weekend, and it was saying like 13 players. So yeah, uh, I know Gattuso's out is definitely out. Um, I think Gatun's also on that list. Uh, Yamane played this weekend. Oh, then they're gonna um, lose. It's yeah, so they've they've got a pretty there, extensive. Really. They've got a pretty extensive list. We uh, Yelenich is also out. So yeah, they've they've got quite a few guys that they're sweating over for this one. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I think they did go manage to try and arrest sort of the big players mm. um, in last week because they had that game against Upstart and they basically played the second team there. Um, yeah, guys, this is obviously the match of all matches. Uh, Sean, yeah, <laughs> what are you looking forward to? What are you looking forward to see? I think you think we'll win. Uh, uh, it's really hard to look past Leinster, but I do think that they are going to be a little bit rusty. And I feel that if Toulouse are going to take this, they have to they have to take the first 15 minutes and, and blow Lens out the water and give them like to make them doubt that the machine is gonna is gonna get them through. Um because the only way to do that against uh, the only way to stop Lens is to make them doubt themselves and they they that that's not even in their vocabulary over the last uh, over the season. So for me, you've got to come out hard and fast. The uh, two lose are going to be loose. They're going to want to. They're going to want to play expansive game. They're not going to want Leinster to settle down, and that's the only way that they're going to win it. Um, whether they can sustain it and whether Leinster will be out of the game long enough that Toulouse can get away from them is is the big, big question. Um, I would love Toulouse to win, but I don't. I don't see it happening. I think Leinster take it, which is a bit of a bit of a boring boring message because i mean it's really hard to bet against leinster but i i, I don't know but it's going to be a great game <laughs> can i go for it what 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 what's your take on the match yeah i, I think leinster season's coming to end in the next fortnight so that's the way i'll put it oh, is wow. uh <laughs> Lens, I, I, i'm 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 half joking about the sharks one um i think the sharks could go and beat leinster in the quarterfinals but it's it's very unlikely but I think this match, um, seriously, I think Toulouse will come in and beat Leinster. I think Sean yeah. mentioned that Leinster will be a bit rusty, but both sides are sort of um, bringing their stars back from holidays and chucking them both in the starting lineup. So I think it will be a bit of a rusty start for both sides. But I reckon Toulouse take this one. Um, I've, I've just seen some of their games recently, even when they've been playing change sides and they bring some of their stars off of the bench. They just pull away from teams, and yeah, I I don't want to bet against a team that has Anton Dupont in it, and I think yeah. uh, him Crazy, and yeah. Malfu will will lead uh, to to lose to victory. The yeah, I was just gonna ask you, Sean. Do you think um Jenkins, you know, Bear, those sort of players will make a big difference because we know Leinster has a bit of a weakness against um, big Australian blocks like Malfu. She. Yeah, that's a great shot. Jenkins having uh, to a bit injury under injury cloud at the moment, I think. Um, so that could be quite interesting to see what they do. The as much as Toulouse need to spread it wide, they're also going to um, muscle up. And 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 I actually, it did slip my mind that um, that Leinster slightly suspect under a massive bulky carrying team. But I think they're going to 
want to be more mobile for a big bulky carrying team if it makes sense i think they're going to be kind of more extreme on both of them but uh yeah it's very interesting I, we're really in for a tight game okay well, we can make predictions in just a few moments going to the la Rochelle exeter game um yeah i think um jared you can just correct me if i'm wrong i don't know if there's too many yeah injury updates on both sides anything that you know of no, there, there, there actually isn't anything I know of. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think it's going to be a very interesting game. Um, La Rochelle obviously trying to defend, um, well, defend the title, and uh, I think they're coming, they're coming up against a Exeter team that's pretty much it's a last hurrah for them, and I think that emotional drive is going to be a big factor in the match, and whether La Rochelle can withstand that is is pretty much going to decide the game so yeah Exeter have got quite a bit of stick this season because they haven't quite performed to their potential but in, in knockout rugby it doesn't matter how the rest of the season goes it's just what you do in that 80 minutes so yeah I think it's going to be a, a cracking game as well Sean and then just on the La Rochelle side I mean yeah they're playing at home they're the big team so you expect that they would be the ones that I mean X hasn't faced anything like 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 the La Rochelle, I think so far, Champions Cup. So you'd expect them to sort of do what they do best in terms of, you know, trusting their forwards, you know, letting Aldrich and Gutier just run wild in the rucks and then getting their backline finishes to do the job. Yeah, I I think it'll end up being a comfortable win for them. I think uh, Exeter will get blown out the water. Um, they've been a bit erratic this year. They've won a couple of games that they many didn't expect them to win because they went off form. So they've still got that core and that mindset of, of when they won a few years back. So um, when they won in, in Premiership and, and Europe. So it's, it's going to be huge. I just don't think they're going to have enough to last the whole way in France. So La Rochelle for me. Okay, so La Rochelle for Sean, Jared? Yeah, uh, another all French final. Ooh, okay. And then, Sean, is your prediction for Leicester to lose Leinster or to lose? Yeah, I kind of, uh, I kind of na- nailed it to the cross there and said Leinster, so I probably have to stick with that. But I'd, I'd love uh, to lose to win, but I think Leinster take it. I'm yeah, happy to I'm be gonna... proved wrong though. I'm, I'm super happy. <laughs> I'm gonna also go for a semi-final repeat. I mean, final repeat from last year: Leinster versus La Rochelle in the final. Hopefully, Exeter does pitch up to the game. We saw that. Um, Luke Cowan Dickey didn't pitch up to his medical um, for his move to Montpellier, which means it fell apart. So <laughs> hopefully they have a better shot at that. I've heard of Salut, so, uh, just talking about people that haven't pitched up, uh, can we talk about the stadium connoisseur that was supposed to give <laughs> us an update this week? And uh, after Finn Russell lost to Perpignan, he's just, he's just yeah, sorry, gents can't make it. <laughs> Well, we, we know by now that in Kutz's rugby bits contract, it says that if Finn Russell has a stinker, then he's not going to make the podcast. So that's that's not surprising at all, unfortunately. So I, I assume he, he he used that he used that to his advantage. Russell, are they even going to make the top six? Ooh, they're, they're looking a bit dodgy. Um, but yeah, I think Cooks is definitely also taking a sickie like Luke uh, Count Dickey. They're at, yeah, I'm just looking at the log now. They're, okay, they're, they're a few points behind, so it's, it is still possible. Uh, Jets, very quickly, Toulon um, versus Benetton and Glasgow versus Scarlets. Uh, Jared, who are your finalists for the Challenge Cup? Uh, Toulon to win. Um, and the, the Franco Warriors. So Franco <laughs> Warriors versus Toulon in the final. Okay. Sean? Yeah, I'm the same. Yeah. I, 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 I'm I going to go for a surprise shock Benetton win away from home and Benetton Glasgow as the final. And then some nervous moments for Connacht fans to consider if they're going to be in the Champions Cup. <laughs> <laughs> you just here for the for the for the chaos. <laughs> yeah, man, I just want people to do a bit of maths Always. and counts on their fingers and toes and all that sort of stuff. No, you must do a little bit of what's called Bafana maths to just see if your team is comfortable, if they can go through or do what <laughs> they need to do. So 
I, I do like a bit of that chaos at the end of the season. Listen, after the after the protests have done that to South Africa in <laughs> countless World Cups, uh, <laughs> we're, a bit, we're scared when it comes down to last game stuff, you know? Oh, and, and they love to do that as well. But yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I saw Sharks fans like also just making those calculations during the game. And being like, okay, what if we do this and all that sort of stuff? Like, yeah, it's, I, I, that's my sort of like guilty, guilty pleasure in the but yeah, let us end it there. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us for another episode of the Ragged Bits podcast. Thank you, Jared and Sean, as well. Uh, yeah, please follow us on our social media sites um, for, it, for all updates during the course of the week. And please follow us um, on our website as well, ragged.com. And we will see you wrapping up the big uh, European semi final.